But this is C.J. Baker, and this is episode 15 of the ongoing history of protest music. Companion podcast to the website, ongoing history of protest songs.com. So today we got a special guest, Carl Evangelista of the experimental music duo Rex, who are releasing a new album, Everything You Said Was Wrong, on September 5th. So thanks for being here, Carl. Thank you so much for having me. So we're doing this over Zoom, so we all social distancing. <laughs> so how are you managing with the pandemic? Uh, we're we're fine. The complexity, um, obviously, in the United States is is severe, and in California especially, we lock down very early, and the situation has just ex uh, has just more or less uh, gotten exponentially worse <laughs> as time has progressed. So um, both as a California resident and as a musician, it's been pretty difficult in the past several months. Yeah, I guess as a musician, at least any I've talked to, you probably have had a number of concerts and tours canceled and probably affected that. Yeah, we would have been on tour right now, actually, yeah. if that had been the case. So everything is effectively just um, shuttered right now. So you've been doing a lot of live streaming or? Yeah, that's that's been basically it. There's actually, there's been a lot of, um, I was just talking to someone about this, but one of the advantages of the community here and maybe um, of the people who operate in sort of fringe musics is that there was already an infrastructure in place, an alternative infrastructure in place that allowed for things like live streaming. So the adaptation wasn't very difficult but um, the financial circumstances were are, are still untenable. It was still difficult. Okay, so at least a little bit of a positive there. Yeah. But still a challenge. So as we previously mentioned, you'll be releasing a new album as part of your duo. Everything you said was wrong on September 5th. So what's the significance of that album title? Um, so... Actually, it's a paraphrase of a line from the last Star Wars movie, or no, two Star Wars movies ago. That's sort of the, but the, um, it's it's also a way of so it's it's simultaneously attempt an, our attempt to kind of be self-effacing, um, operating on a cultural fringe or an artistic fringe, but also I mean on a certain level a political fringe as well. Um, when they're um, when you're when you're out on the edges sometimes it's difficult to assess whether what you're doing is correct yeah. so it's also our way of saying that we're not even really sure if what we were doing was the right course of action as i think is often the case um but it's um simultaneously our way of um attempting to self-define because this band has had a difficult time not only with category but just sort of fitting in to um like these overarching cultural strictures so, um, yeah, it's also a way of saying that, um, you know, we're going to have to be the ones to define who, who we are. It's very difficult for us to fit within your categories, which I know is kind of a hoity-toity way to say it, but it's, you know, reflected in reality. Yep, it is. So I would say, like, the album as a whole, I would definitely describe it as socially aware. Like, it seems to, like, there's a couple of songs that seem to touch upon issues of anti-conformity, and I know there's at least one song that addresses environmental issues. But I would say the most politically direct song on the album appears to be Crinimal, which I know yeah. will be released as a video on September 1st. Uh, what was the motivation behind that song? So this is a, <laughs> this is a complex story. But um, I come from what has effectively become a political family in the Philippines. Yeah. So I'm a dual citizen. I was born in California. Uh, my aunt uh, was Miriam Defensor Santiago. She was a... A three-time presidential candidate in the Philippines. I hope I'm getting that number right. But she ran in 1992, and she technically won the election. No. And she was never able to take office because of what has come to be acknowledged in the historical sense as, you know, pretty significant voter fraud, as is the case with the Philippines. Yeah. Um, but um, because of her, I have had some mind toward activism in Filipino politics, but despite the fact that I am, for all intents and purposes, an American. Um, and... Um, I discovered at a certain point over the course of my artistic trajectory that um, what I had thought was just um, coming from a place of, you know, cultural reference with regard to, you know, traditional Filipino musics or traditional Filipino concepts 
um, I, I, I was not as much at liberty to say things as I thought I was. Like, for example, um, several albums ago, I had this record called Taglish, um, and I rearranged the Filipino National Anthem. I later on found out that this was a jailable offense. Oh. <laughs> Apparently, you cannot rearrange the Filipino National Anthem at all. It cannot be in a different tempo. Uh, oh. it, it cannot be in a, in a different tempo, in a different meter, um, in a different key than it was originally composed in. Um, and so there was some sense that this would cause minor political um, or at least, you know, interpersonal um, carnage were it released. It got released anyway under a different name because it became oh. a different composition at that point. Yeah. So um, before my aunt passed away a couple of years ago, she ran against Duterte. And it was this was before his um, engagement with his practice of extrajudicial killings was made really plain. Yeah. In fact, there was a lot of support for him in the Philippines just because he seemed, you know, much as Trump did in the States, he seemed very much as a um, as a, a not career politician, someone who was more, yeah. you know, grassroots and he was a, and, and appealing to sort of populist sentiment. And yeah. then, after, of course, after he took office, it became clear that there was all of this fascistic underpinning. So um, criminal was my attempt to both speak to that practice to Duterte's shift toward these fascistic practices and also an attempt, I guess, in a way to understand how the Filipino people would empathize with a person like that after, you know, decades, centuries of, you know, of uh, colonization and, you know, I guess also homegrown fascism. That's just been the yeah. case of the Philippines forever. Yeah. So. Yeah, so you already, I guess, touched upon it a little bit. So when you write a song that's that direct, is there concerns about potential backlash? Uh, artistically, I mean, in a very general sense, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> artistically, no. Just ah. because I feel like one of the advantages of um, the arts, as I, I'm, I'm sure you're very aware by virtue of you know this website that you run, yeah. Um, and one of the and one of the conclusions I've come to, you know, coming from the family that I've come from, is that as an artist, it's sort of your responsibility to speak to things. Yeah. And you are granted, a, not immunity is not the right word, but you are, yeah. you are granted a degree of understanding for trying to explore these subjects because this yeah. isn't politics and not speaking for the record in the same way. Yeah. But uh, at the same time, and I, I am not making this up, <laughs> even though this has come up many times, there is a very real danger of retaliation. No. You know, uh, I have had to travel with bodyguards in the Philippines. Yeah. And um, in America, you are not as protected. And Duterte has his... Um, supporters in america there there is no clear extent to the repercussions for this no I, my hope is that any sort of danger is imagined at this point but um there's if, if you do this kind of work there's never a 100 percent guarantee that you're safe that's just how mm -hmm. it is and i guess it's something to keep in mind because i've talked to other guests before and when you talk about potential backlash it's just that a few fans might be pissed off but it sounds in your case might even be a slightly greater concern there. My, my, I, I think for the most part. So we, we've, we in in a in a in a German native sense have been performing this song for a year, two years on the road. Actually, we were able to take it on the last tour. It was ready in some form um, by then. And I've actually found the response in the quarters we've played it in in America to be just overwhelmingly positive. Just it, it has resonated with. I mean, people are pissed off, as you know. Yeah. It's just it's one of those things that taps into that kind of fury, that kind of song. My concern is always for personal safety. Yeah. And if I can get over the personal safety concern, there are benefits um, to playing a song like this otherwise. Yeah, because music does play an important role of drawing awareness to issues. That's Maybe right. especially to an audience who might not be aware of it. Sure. Because I even know of myself, it's even though I do try to keep informed with the news and Sometimes it's hard to focus on that, so music's an important way that I process things. So, of course, quite yeah. often it's songs that's going to help draw awareness. So that's an important role there. And I know outside of music, I know you're also involved with like community activism as well. Sure. That's involved with that work. So, um, the one of the the taglines for this record that I've been using is. Uh, just because it made sense. So this is just the sound of um, normal life creeping back into the music, yeah. which is, I mean, that's just the case. I, be, being in the Bay, uh, if you're a musician, just due to the economics of this area, you're you're forced into an activist role. Otherwise, you just yeah. can't survive here. Yeah. Um, if I'm sure many are attuned 
to what's been happening here um, within with regard to just rampant gentrification. Yeah, I, I live yeah, so. close to the Oakland Flatlands. I'm not quite there, but the Oakland Flatlands are still um, deeply impoverished, and um, there's still, I mean, for example, like a great deal of tension with law enforcement, you know, and moneyed interests. That's just always been the case, you know, wherever we've lived in the Bay. And so, um, as a musician, my first recourse here was just to work in education. So I was working in community education up in Richmond, which was actually in an even dire situation than Oakland for a very long time. And all of the kids that I was working with there were coming from not only impoverished communities, but from like really dangerous and sometimes like really difficult personal situations. And so that made me attuned to, I just, I guess for me, just the responsibility of if you're going to, if you're working as a musician, if you're working as a cultural representative for the area, yeah, your responsibility, not just, uh, to your art, but also to the people you're working with in your community. And so um, over the course of several years, um, not only have I been, you know, forced to um, interface with the community in meaningful ways, but we've also just been doing a lot of fundraisers. We've been involved in mm -hmm. any number of like the past series of protest movements um, in the area, because I mean, Oakland has a very long history of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't divorce that activity from the artistic activity. It's just always gone hand in hand. You know? Yeah, so I guess it's safe to say that you view your music as an extension of your activism then? It's it's had to be, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep, so it's good that you're using that platform. So going back to your music, because there's something else that stood out about your music and the album as well. Like I know you have like, for example, three songs in a row about rats. And I know this is a subject right. that you seem to <laughs> written about in the past as well. So what is it about rats? Well, um, in so far, so it's a, the rats, rats are for, for me. And I mean, my partner would, would, might speak to this difference. So we, we I mean, we love rats. We think they're, yeah. I mean, just on, just on a, on a, fl on a basic perspective as pets, they're fantastic pets. Okay. They're pretty low maintenance. They're deeply social and they're, they're friendly. Okay. You know, the, the only, the only thing is they don't live very long. Yeah. So um, you basically you invest a lot of emotion um, and you invest a lot of time and commitment into just caring for these creatures and they're very present in your life and then they're not there anymore. So, I mean, that's on the on the one hand, that's I mean, just it's that's that's a good substance for, you know, writing music around. At the same time, I've always felt that like those rat songs are sort of a microcosm of just our life in the area yeah. just because rats are effectively social and desirables. Yeah. You know, my first experience with rats was because my, my partner and my bandmate had rats first. Um, she basically just took her first rat and just dumped the rat, uh, dumped uh, her, wicka wicka on my shoulders, and I just had to kind of deal with it. You know, <laughs> I just suddenly had a rat on my shoulders. I didn't know what to do. Yeah. And then I gradually developed, like, a sense of love for these animals. But um, I guess our, our constant return to rats as subject matter has a lot to do with the idea that these are creatures that are deserving of a lot of you know love and care and they're creatures that also most people just don't like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know just on a surface level and i i find that really interesting it's very similar to our experiences if again if you're working in fringe music if you're living in a difficult community like i feel like that's something you can relate to yeah and i think that's because it did seem to have like a deeper metaphorical meaning there i think it is something that's relatable because for example even if you're looking at in politics it's quite often you see like the class distinction. So there's a group of people that are all undesirable and they don't get the, the attention that they, or the love that they deserve. Good. So musically, like what is some of your influences? That so, um, the band, oh, sorry. I, I think we had a slight delay. What was that? What was the end of your last question? I just Oh, just the idea of what your musical influences were. Oh. Yeah. So um, the band has always been um, bridging of two poles. Yeah. So um, my partner's, her background, uh, her background when she was, so we, we met at Mills College. Um, okay. I was in the graduate program, um, which is co-ed there. Um, we're, we're, we're roughly the same age, and she was finishing up her a degree in biology. Mm -hmm. um, she was working a lot in the music department, and they have this battery of performance opportunities. Um, she was working in the Baroque Music Ensemble. She was working in Gamelan, because okay. there's this long, like, very storied history of, you know, transporting um, Gamelan instruments and performance practices to the bay. So she was working in the Gamelan mm -hmm. Ensemble there. 
So all of her work has been um, in dealing with alternative performance practices on the one hand and songs. She just would write a lot of songs. Yeah. And then my background has always been in jazz. Um, I had this uh, second life um, as a... I, I would never call myself of note <laughs> as a pre basically as a free free jazz musician a free improviser i guess yeah. of 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 existence i don't know if of note is a stretch but um the um idea was so i was uh, at mills i was studying under fred frith and under roscoe mitchell um not exclusively but like primarily i was working with yeah. them quite a bit and this was sort of when we started working together, Ray and I. It was the uh, it was an opportunity to sort of in, find a way to channel my understanding of, of improvised music into yeah. into tighter structures, into smaller structures. I just thought yeah. that, that was an interesting challenge, and it yeah. wasn't something that was being dealt with much um, at Mills, where everything is sort of like sort of expansive, mm. um, and. Um, which isn't to say that people weren't dealing with minimalist structures. It was more, I just found it a really difficult challenge to do that. And I found yeah. the challenge interesting. And so, um, especially on this record, um, those influences, the improvised music influence, influences are more to the fore. Um, we, we studied a bit with Milford Graves, the drummer for whom yeah. we're raising, a, we're, for whom we're raising money on September five, there's going to be a live stream concert in um, support of this, in support of this record. And all the proceeds are going to the ACLU and in Milford who is unwell. I don't know. Some people have read the New York Times article, but he's not doing well. Okay. So um, we studied under Milford Graves, and that just gave us the idea to kind of go full tilt in the direction of abstraction with the improvised episodes um, and find a way to fit those in a two or three minute song structures. And the connective tissue there wound up being electronic music and sort of experimental hip hop, just because it seemed like that was already in the ethos of that music. So. Yeah. Yep. So a good blend there. So are there any artists in particular that influenced, as you mentioned, Milford there, um, any other artists that influenced the action of the sound or? The, um, so these, I've, I've always gravitated personally toward drummers. Okay. That's the odd thing because I'm a guitar player. Um, yeah. Even though I've, I, I did a lot of the drumming on this record just by virtue of us having a program because yeah. of isolation. Yeah. After we recorded with two percussionists, our friend Robert Lopez, who's been in the band and Nava Dunkelman, yeah. we wound up having to do everything <laughs> in post-production. Uh, there's a, you keep, we couldn't record anymore with percussionists once lockdown started. Yeah. So, um, but uh, Louis Maholo Maholo, um, who, I, who I released a record with earlier this year, South mm -hmm. African drummer, his just attitude toward this process mm -hmm. of him, of... Um, always trying to get his music to relate to the cause of freeing South Africa because he was a lifelong anti-apartheid advocate. And he's, and he's the only member of his band, the only, the only one in his sort of like um, orbit who managed to survive to the end of apartheid. That, that psychology and the way that that psychology influenced his sound, not necessarily yeah. in the way of like um, technical processes, um, but also just like attitude and fury and like having like a degree of direction that was deeply influential to us. And then also, you know, always like sound wise, sound world wise, um, we've been always been really fascinated by um, this later wave of what would be called experimental hip hop. Yeah. You know, Death Grips has been culturally digested to a certain degree. And that also has like a level of, you know, like anarchy kind of tied into it. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe a lack of a lack of activist direction, which I found interesting. Just because yeah. the music is related to this tradition of, you know, bands like Rage Against the Machine that are just very overtly activist. And the fact that that's been decoupled from the activism, I found fascinating. Yeah. And so just that sort of like agnostic kind of attitude, I wanted to kind of tap into to a degree with this music because I, I found that that was appealing. Um, so, yeah, I'd say that those were the those were just the principal poles there, just like hardcore free improvisation, experimental hip hop. OK, so a little bit of everything there. And a combination of artists that were socially conscious and those that maybe won't quite as much. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Because is that something you always drawn? Like when you first got started in music, was were you always using it as a platform to make social statements? So. So this is one of those things. Um, this is one of those parallels. I returning to Lewis just briefly. Um, I, I, it may have been due to Bukwana, his his partner. Um, who I, who I believe wound up like playing 
this gigantic festival on behalf of Mandela back in the day, but um, I, I, I may be paraphrasing him, and I think it was Dudu who said that. If it wasn't, it was someone else in the band, this band, the Blue Notes. Mm-hmm. He said, like, I never set out to be political in my music. It just happened by virtue yeah. of the circumstances. Yeah. And when Greg set out to play music, it was more just the experimentation in the music. The process of the experimentation was the priority. Yeah. And we found over time that it was impossible to decouple that from where we were, even just like the venues we were playing. Yeah. You know, at a certain degree, you feel a sense of social responsibility to speak to what the venues are going through, because we've had so much yeah. venue hemorrhage over the course of the past. You can't you can't not speak to that because those are the places that are supporting the existence of the music. If they yeah. are embattled and they are endangered, like in a very literal sense, and they cannot pay rent, yeah. you know, then you it becomes a part of the music. You just can't take it out. And it is something, it is a legitimate concern there, like how all these places going to survive yeah. once, once and if things open up. I mean, we've already seen a bunch of venues, local and semi-local venues close. So mm-hmm. it's, a, <laughs> it's, a, it's pretty sobering every time you just hear about it. And it's not a, there's not a to-do, there's not a closure party. The venues are just gone. Yeah. It's scary, you know. So before we conclude, is there anything you want to plug or say? Or um, So the record, what would have maybe under alternate circumstances been like just a record? Yeah. You know, putting a record out there, promoting it, listen to, listen to my music. <laughs> it's just yeah. not, it's not a thing anymore. It's yeah. done. And I, I know that different people have, have found different ways of rationalizing and, um, I think you don't need to justify anything. It's music. That's like the, the amazing thing yeah. about art, you know, but they've had, they found different ways of trying to make their music meaningful. And for us, after a certain point, I just thought, I want this in the hands of people who are going to care about it. Yeah. It can help some people just because I think there's a lot of need for catharsis and just something yeah. resembling artistic, you know, reception, like receiving of art right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and also I just thought that because of this current move moment in protest and just social visibility, you know, everyone. So, you know, when after after George Floyd's um, murder, there was just this overarching feeling that not only were people being responding to, to his death, they were also responding to this idea of just being coiled up and stuck inside all the time. Yeah, that's kind of that. bottling up emotions. Combination so, of both. Yeah. The, so this pressurized feeling, um, it's a, it's an it's I've also seen it to a degree as an opportunity to engage with people in meaningful ways. So um, some de- like some degree of the proceeds for the lifetime of this record and all of the proceeds for the initial week are again going to be going to to support milford who is one of the progenitors of this music he mm-hmm. this is one of those things about putting your money where your mouth is in terms yeah. of taking music from these people and also giving it back and also to the aclu and possibly a handful of local community organizations yeah. of note um we just want the music to be useful we just want people to hear it and we thought that this was the best way to do it so we're going to be running a live stream festival on September 5 in celebration of that. And those details are going to be announced soon. Good. So it sounds like it's good. Like the music itself is going to be worth listening to as someone who had a chance to listen to the album. But the fact that you're using it as an outreach to do good work as well. Yeah. Something that's commendable as well. And I guess even a good point as far as giving back, because I know there are some artists now that are talking about that a bit. Like, I think the most visible individual I heard talk about was like Jeff Tweedy from Wilco, who's talking about giving reparations back. But I think sure. that's an important conversation to have within the music community. I mean, you that's consider, complex. Yeah. You know, I'm oh, sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. There's nope. just like a slight, but yeah. Yeah. The, I, that's interesting you mentioned that. I have actually heard the word reparations. Yeah. There's a big, I mean, as I've always thought about this, and this gets into a territory, I know we're concluding. <laughs> this is a hard <laughs> tangent now. <But> that's okay. <laughs> but this this actually gets into a territory I find fascinating, which is that as, as a as a full-blooded Filipino, I have always yeah. been on the periphery of this debate, Yeah. like in terms of um, black music and white appropriation of black music. Yeah. And also the, the fact that that is um, such a tense territory in America, just period. 
Yeah, it is. And so, and I, I mean, Asians, uh, you know, Filipinos, we've also taken a lot from black culture. We've taken a lot from white culture as well. So it's been interesting, the idea of operating from an activist perspective and knowing that you have a responsibility to not just speak to these issues, but kind of participate in them. So some of the conversations I've had with intimates in the area, a lot of them white musicians have actually used the word reparations. Yeah. And so in a, in a, in a sideways way, um, I don't want to think of our contribution to Milford in that way, but it is definitely a way of sort of giving back to this generation who, again, and this sounds extreme, but those people literally died for our opportunity, a lot of them, to kind of play music in a certain way. So I just, I feel like we should take care of them, you know, when we can. Yeah, I think it's an important discussion to be had. So I'd like to thank you again, and I definitely encourage everyone to check out your album. Everything you said was wrong, which will be coming out on September 5th. Yeah, and thank you so much for having me. This is a, it's a great website you put together. Oh, thanks.